Hello and thank you for tuning in to Middle East Matters. I'm Rochelle ferguson Biahi. coming up in the programme. In Israel, a controversial nation-state bill will pass into law in the coming days, despite critics claiming it will deny equal rights to non-Jewish citizens. After the World Cup in Russia, attention turns to 2022 host Qatar, which is forging ahead with preparations despite a blockade by neighbour Saudi Arabia. Plus, in the Iraqi capital, where political and cultural life are gaining pace, we meet the uh, well-known Iraqi actress Iqbal Naim, head of the country's theatre and cinema industries. But first, a uh, ceasefire announced by Hamas largely holds this week after the uh, most severe exchange of fire between Israel and Palestinian militants in the Gaza Strip since a 2014 war. Well, Israel declined to comment, while Hamas has said the truce was reached with the help of Egypt and others. The ceasefire comes following deadly clashes on the Israel-Gaza border. Well, meanwhile, Israel's uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has said a controversial nation-state bill will pass into law in the coming days. The bill has sparked intense debate with critics claiming it will deny equal rights to non-Jewish citizens. Legally defining Israel as the national home of the Jewish people, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is hoping to make this legislation into one of Israel's basic laws. Recognizing Jewish holidays, asserting the symbols on the Israeli flag, making Hebrew their only official language. The right-wing government has already watered down one of the most contentious articles that authorized Jewish-only communities. The language was modified to say that developing Jewish settlements is a national value. Nothing changes except for granting legitimacy to the Jewish people for their own state. It's natural that this should be written into law. Supporters of the bill praised Netanyahu's efforts to underscore the Jewish character of Israel. But Arab members of the Knesset fear this law would officially condone the separation of different communities. It is a segregation. It is the absolute translation and implementation of so-called apartheid. Around 20 percent of Israelis are Arab. Some fear that the nation-state bill could cement their status as second-class citizens. As Arab citizens here, we are the original inhabitants of this country. We were born here and we lived here. Many Jewish people came to this country. How you will turn it into a Jewish state? This is a racist law against Arabs. Rights groups, opposition politicians, members of the LGBT community and other progressive groups took to the streets Saturday to voice their discontent. Critics fear that a basic law on Israel's Jewish character that doesn't mention equal rights for all citizens is a slippery slope for Israeli democracy. Next, marking the end of the 2018 FIFA World Cup in Russia, President Vladimir Putin has handed over the mantle of uh, World Cup host to 2022 host Qatar. Well, at a Kremlin ceremony, Putin gave an official World Cup football to FIFA president Gianni Infantino, who then handed it on to the Emir of Qatar, Sheikh Tamim bin Hamid El Thani. Well, Qatar's uh, previously faced allegations of corruption and poor working conditions for labourers. These days, it's up against a blockade imposed by its larger neighbour, Saudi Arabia. But as this next report shows, Qatar is uh, forging ahead with World Cup preparations at all costs. In Doha, skyscrapers seem to continuously rise from the ground. New cities, highways, a metro system. Qatar plans to spend 200 billion euros organizing the next World Cup, more than any other nation before it. But the bill could soar, because for a year, Qatar has been subject to an economic embargo by Saudi Arabia. Despite the blockade, the construction sites are running at full speed. In total, Qatar has embarked on the construction of eight stadiums of colossal dimensions for a small country of only two million inhabitants. Bedouin tents, traditional boats. During the World Cup, Qatar intends to use these stadiums, inspired by local culture, to highlight its heritage. The architect and inspiration thought of having different ships on the shore being maintained, and you could see the bottom of the ship, actually. In spite of the Saudi embargo, there's no question of Qatar cutting back on construction, even if that requires tapping into its financial reserves. So the country has had to urgently reorganize all its import channels by sea or air. 
We changed some materials. We looked for alternative sources of supply. As a result, the shipyards have not officially suffered any delays. To meet the deadlines, Qatar relies on a cheap and numerous workforce. Coming from the Indian subcontinent, these laborers work in temperatures that exceed 50 degrees in the summer. Human rights organizations have denounced the dozens of deaths that occur each year due to the dangerous conditions. A spokesperson from among the organizers of the World Cup gave us a rushed tour of one of their accommodation sites. Free laundry, supermarket there, big supermarket, barber shop. And we have them at clinic here, gym, we have a gym, sports, facilities. There's no time to ask questions of the employees and we're told we have to leave. Qatar's only concession to international pressure to improve their conditions has been the adoption of a minimum wage of 166 euros per month. Having made huge financial investments, Qatar also intends to shine on the playing field. For the last 15 years, the Emirate has been searching for talent in the country's football schools. The best players are sent to a luxurious sports complex, the Aspire Academy. Each year, 100 students recruited for their athletic abilities train here, and all of them dream of following the path of their idols at Paris Saint-Germain, the Parisian club that's owned by the Qatari royal family. In this class, there are children of Indian workers, Gambians, Sudanese and Palestinians. But the majority are Qataris. Whereas in the past, the country has been criticized for naturalizing sportsmen during competitions so as to compete for them, the ambitions of the authority now are clear to train a generation of athletes capable of winning medals. This opportunity is given to young people living in Qatar, whether they are Qatari or children of foreign residents. It's not just the Football World Cup that Qatar will host, but also the next athletics and swimming world championships. More than ever, Qatar is banking on sport to make its presence known on the international stage. Now, protests which have swept across several of Iraq's southern cities have now entered their second week. Violent clashes between demonstrators and security forces over poor public services and corruption have already left several people dead. Well, next, uh, France 24's Claire Rush explores the most recent developments. The southern commodities port of Umm Qasr reopened on Monday, three days after protesters shut down the facility and spreading social unrest over a lack of public services and government corruption. Truck drivers say the protests left them stuck at the port for 12 days. Authorities closed the port for fear of being looted by protesters. Protesters had blocked the road to the port as daily demonstrations over electricity cuts and water shortages evolved into broader calls against government corruption and unemployment. Protests began on July 8th in the southern city of Basra and have since spread to Diyala in the east and the capital of Baghdad. Unemployment is destroying the people of Basra. The polluted water is killing the soil, the animals and the people. In the south, demonstrators have targeted key sites, including oil fields and the nearby Najaf International Airport, as seen in this amateur video. At times, the demonstrations have turned into violent clashes with police. Iraq's interior minister has defended the right to protest, but warned of police intervention. The Ministry of the Interior does not take part in any political debate. Our duty is clear, to apply law and to maintain public order. The protests have challenged Prime Minister Haider al-Abadi, who is seeking a second term after a parliamentary election in May that was riddled with allegations of fraud. In a visit to Basra on Friday, Abadi announced the government would invest $3 billion in the area for schools, housing and public services. Away from southern Iraq to the capital Baghdad next, where following victory over the Islamic State group and recent elections, political and cultural life appear to be slowly gaining momentum. A year ago, well-known actress Iqbal Naim was named head of Iraq's theatre and cinema industries, and she's wasted no time in taking up that challenge. Iqbal Naim asked to meet us in a neighbourhood once known for its vibrant art scene. The Montada Theatre is something of a relic from that easier time. 
Its walls are covered with old photos of the actress. Who's the woman in the photo? That's me. I was in a play by Jean Genet that was part of Baghdad's Arabic theater festival. The woman now in charge of Iraq's theater and cinema scene is also a star of the screen herself. We're a family. We've been working on this project now for one, two years. Iqbal Naim is here to attend an actor's workshop. As far as theater is concerned, she's a woman who really knows that world inside out, both as an actress and as a director. She'll be able to find solutions to the current crisis at the heart of Iraqi theater. A crisis familiar to any country that's been forced to endure years of war. Money's tight and corruption is rife. Now responsible for 250 employees, Iqbal Naim says she's hiring more women and streamlining operations. She's spoken out against cinematic projects that misuse precious funds. The culture ministry doesn't really have a budget. It's hard to operate in a country that isn't yet politically stable with the war and the Islamic State group. It's hard to get our projects off the ground. But we're trying. Next stop, the theater. We're going to see a play put on by the National Theater. It's about corruption and how it manifests in daily life, in the world of medicine and among some members of parliament. Comedies like this are striking a chord, bringing Baghdad residents through the doors once again. Making sure productions are economically viable is a key part of Iqbal Naim's new role. Projects are funded by ticket sales and ticket sales alone. Well, that's it from your Middle East Matters team for this week. Don't forget you can contact us by visiting our Facebook page, Middle East Matters at France 24, or you can drop us a tweet. Thanks so much for watching. Eye on Africa, presented by Georgia Calvin Smith. Africa News, your eyes on Africa bringing you the latest from across the continent. Eye on Africa, on France 24 and France24.com.